Hi everyone, welcome to Being Youthful. I am Kim Beegler, the owner of Youthful Fiber Farm and Mill. This is episode 71. And if you're new to my channel or my podcast, here comes a car. Um, if you're new, I talk all about wool, farming, owning a wool mill, hand spinning, knitting, all those things. So um, if you are just listening to the podcast, know that you can jump over to YouTube to being youthful if you feel like you missed out on seeing something that I showed. But I try to explain things well enough that uh, you don't feel like you've missed too much, but just know it's there. So before I forget, there are two mill days in June. I talked about this last episode and I just wanted to put it out there. Saturday, June 10th, as well as Saturday, June, oof, I'm gonna say 24th, but I'm not sure. Uh, basically the one at the end of the month is because a lot of people come into this area to go to Black Sheep Gathering, a big fiber festival. And it's only about a half hour away from here. I will not be vending at it this year, which usually I am. So I thought, well, I'll open the mill shop on Saturday. People coming through are only gonna be a little bit away. And if they wanna pop into the mill, I'll be here. And I'll have the equipment set up. So if people wanna wander through and kind of see how the process goes, they can. I will only be open 11 to 3 on those days. So slightly later opening because Mitch will be farming, which means I have to do all the morning stuff myself. Usually on mill days, he helps me out. But um, during the summer, not, not an option that I want to have him have to worry about. So 11 to 3, those two days. Come out, shop, hang out, eat snacks, do whatever. Um, I don't have a ton of videos to show you at the end because Mitch and I took a little trip. I know it seems like I've just been tripping away lately. If I film every loud car, which there aren't a lot. Um, anyway, we went to the Columbia River Gorge out to Cascade Locks, which is a very small town out on the gorge. If you have read, I can't remember the name of the book, but it's Reese Witherspoon was in the movie about the woman that does the Pacific Crest Trail at the end where she stops to get ice cream and there's the bridge of the gods that's cascade lock so that's where we stayed we had a cute little house mitch set it all up surprised me with where we were going it was we kind of tried to do a trip before harvest so that we can spend a little time together be right before harvest starts um and it was also our wedding anniversary we happened to actually get to celebrate our wedding anniversary together which was pretty fun so um, we had a really nice time. I have a few clips from that just out along the Columbia River Gorge because I realize lots of you have not been out there. It's absolutely beautiful. We used to live, um, when we were first dating, we had a house in a town not too far off of the Columbia River Gorge. So we would kind of go to these places for day trips for lunch and stuff. And anyway, it was a really nice trip. Lots of knitting and spinning and just hanging out and talking. And there's lots of breweries and stuff out there. So uh, we supported all of them as well. Okay, I did want to catch you up on some of my works in progress because I have not showed you anything in a while and I promise that I have been doing stuff. So first off, the project that I really should be focusing on, but for some reason I'm not 100% focusing on, is my um, summer shirt. Anker's summer shirt. You can see how far I've gotten. Look at that. I think I have maybe an inch and a half and then I just have to do the bottom ribbing and it's short sleeve. So there's really nothing left. I am knitting this in 100% cotton. So 100% uh, this would be the time I should be wearing it. So I'm going to get it done soon. I'm, my goal is before the next time I am on with you all, I will have this done. Maybe I'll be wearing it. Hopefully I'll be wearing it. Let's goal for that. You guys can try to hold me accountable to that. We'll see how it goes. Anyway, I am knitting this in Sistari's 100% cotton yarn. I, you know, a lot of people, I'm, even when they see me working on it, they're like, oh, that hurts my hands to look at. Or I have really not had an issue with Sistari's cotton. I mean, it's not wool. It's not going to have the bounce back of wool. And if you haven't knit with cotton, and you've only knit with wool or crocheted with wool, the difference with cotton is there's not that bounce back to it that wool has. So it can be a little bit stiffer to work with and tighter on your hands. I haven't really noticed anything when I'm working on this with my hands so much. Uh, I don't work on it for hours at a time. So that could be why. But there it is, super simple pattern, really well written. Uh, I like that the yoke is simple, but has a little design to it. And then 
it's gonna be really nice. I just really need to finish it, don't I? So um, we're gonna work on that. We're gonna work on that because I probably have not very much left to do on it. Um, a straw just fell out of my knitting bag for all of you wondering and yeah, what wouldn't be in my knitting bag, but a straw. You never know when you're gonna need a straw. Um, okay, so my nurtured sweater, which I have been working on like crazy, which makes no sense because I can't wear it now um, for like five months, easily five months, right? Four months, because it's a pretty heavy sweater. So um, here is my, and I think this, I don't know which one's the front right now, but here is my nurtured sweater. And you can see I have made, I can't see what I'm showing you, but I have made some great progress on this. For those of you listening, I actually have the body is now attached to the two sleeves. For this pattern, this is an Andrea Mallory pattern. You knit the sleeves first, and then you knit the body from bottom up, and then you attach your sleeves, and then you work on the yoke last. So I have got sleeves attached. I'm gonna go up so you can see the texture. I would be further. I mean, I'm in the easy part right now because I'm not gonna drop all my stitches, although this lovely thing about wool right you drop stitches they tend to still be there um this is now we're just decreasing because i'm at the yoke so now i'm decreasing it's going a lot faster the texture is just really amazing so i would be farther on this but i was really cranking on it because it's so dark and i'm sure lots of you have experienced this when you're working with dark wool the more light there's there's just not too much light and I was working on it in the car because when we were on our travels, because there's so much natural light coming into the car, it was perfect. Uh, one thing I wasn't paying attention to was apparently my pattern. <laughs> um, so I got about an inch and a half into the sleeves being joined and I realized on this pattern, you, um, you're just doing a slip and a purl on one row and then you knit and then a slip and a purl and you know. so. Very simple pattern, easy to remember. What I did was I forgot the knit row about an inch and a half back. So it was so not super noticeable. And I kept being like, well, once it's on and if you like do a little stretch, you probably won't notice. Um, I took pictures of it because I was sitting in the car on the way home like, do I rip it out? Do I rip it out? <sighs> of course I ripped it out, but I did wait until I got home and could lay everything out and just rip, rip, rip back. You know, I just took the needles out because it's this lovely non-super wash wool. Um, and so when I pulled the needles out, all the stitches just stayed in a lovely place for me as I ripped back. So anyway, we're back beyond now where I had ripped out. I really recommend, I mean, if you haven't knit an Andrea Mallory pattern, there's a reason she's so popular. Besides her patterns are so cute and hip and fun. Um, they're also really, really well written with lots of tips and notes and things. So anyway, like I said, this is 100% Shetland. I hand spun it. And um, that was part of why I ripped out was like, oh, you already have put so much work, right? You've hand spun all this yarn. Why not just rip out because it's not that bad. So anyway, there we are on that. Those are my two big knitting things right now. My spinning, I have been spinning a fair amount. So this is some of the fiber I got from Maryland Sheep and Wool. This is the Rommeldale, uh, and this is the medium color I got. I also got a dark, so this is like a light brown. I got a dark brown, and I also got a really, really, really light like oatmeal. Um, so I'm mixing, this is my main color. Here is the bobbin. My, this is one ounce is all I have left. So this is actually my bobbins for my Magic Craft Rose Fit. This is four ounces of the Rommeldale fiber. Uh, I'm kind of aiming for a, what am I aiming for? I think a finger, I don't remember what I'm aiming for. I think it was a fingering-ish or sport weight. Maybe it was DK. <laughs> we'll find out in a minute. Anyway. So the first bobbin is done. This is the last ounce I have for the second bobbin and I actually get to start plying. Um, very excited. It's always fun when a bobbin can put that much yarn on it because I still could have gotten, I probably could have got five ounces on it. Um, and I'm sure some question that, especially as a new spinner you may have is how full do you fill a bobbin? Um, 
I think general rule of thumb on a bobbin, unless you're like so close to being done with the fiber and it's going over, I don't go over this the rim of my bobbin size with fiber. So I stop before it's overloaded. I don't overload my bobbin. I think that's kind of the general rule of thumb with it is try not to overload your bobbin. Um, but this still had plenty of room on it. So I'm very excited to finish and to be able to start plying that. I do think, and I brought my pattern because Wendy asked, well, Wendy asked a bit ago, do I usually spin for a project or do I spin and then find a project? Most of the time, 95% of the time I spin and then I find a project for it because when you're spinning, um, it just, it takes a lot to figure out what that end yarn is going to be. You definitely have to spin it. You have to soak it. You have to figure out the bloom. You have to swatch for it. And I um, just find it easier to get all the yarn spun and then start the project. But I didn't do that for this. Obviously, I it just depends. And a lot of times, I'll, if I'm doing like a sweater quantity, a nurtured sweater, I did start before I had spun all the yarn, but I had a good idea at that point. I had a fair amount of the yarn spun. Okay, so here is what I am going to, hopefully you all will be able to see. Here is what I am going to be doing with this. So you can see it's just a little cropped top vest with a little bit of uh, color work at the yoke of it. So my main color is gonna be that bobbin that I just showed you. Um, I think I'm gonna do it without buttons. There are a couple examples of people doing it without buttons and I kind of like that because the buttons are cute. I'm never gonna unbutton it, I don't think. So um, um, it's the, a nice thing about it, it is DK, which is what I generally spin towards. Hopefully this is, I may have spun this a little bit light, but we'll find out. Um, it only calls for 150 to 300 meters and 164 to 328 yards. Uh, it's it's pretty small and that everybody commented in it like it's very fast, doesn't take much yarn. Uh, it's small. So I'll let me pull this little picture up here too so you can see. Um, anyway, I am very excited to get this started. I think it's when I'm looking for patterns. Um, sorry about the reflection, you all. I think I got it there. When I'm looking for patterns with my hands fun, I really am looking for patterns that, um, well, look like they are using 100% wool that's a little bit more heritage-y, a little more rustic yarn, because that's what I tend to hand spin. Um, so anyway, that's what I'm working on. This person, uh, they actually did Newtoden yarn, which is kind of the unspun yarn. So if anything's using Nutidin, it's gonna be a very similar idea to using a hand spun that is pretty rustic. So anyway, that's what I'm working on. I'm sure you start at the yoke, so I probably will have to spin more of the colors before I get to start that, but that's what I'm working on. So there you go, Wendy. Um, okay, I have a couple questions to answer from you all, and then I have a couple videos, and then I'm out of here. We can all go enjoy whatever weather it is we're having, wherever we are. Um, okay, Micah asked, does having the mill equipment make getting the lanolin out easier, especially for a high lanolin fleece? 100%, I would say yes. Now that doesn't mean, I'm sure there are people that have been washing their own fleeces since the beginning of time and they are really efficient at it. Uh, what I like about having my scouring machine is the volume that I can wash at. Like I can easily wash three pounds. I could wash four or five pounds, depending. Um, the volume and the fact that the soap gets pre-measured out for me, the water is coming in, everything is just working. Um, you know, the, the, there's a slow movement in the machine as the wool is soaking in the soap. So everything to me, it just is easier and I can walk away from it. I don't have to worry about it. It's encapsulated in a big metal box. So the water stays warm. So I think so. Yes. Uh, it probably takes me just about an hour to wash three to five pounds of wool. So super easy. Uh, less if I'm doing a high lanolin wool, because I don't want to shove it all in there. Same goes if you're at home washing, if you're doing, a high lanolin wool and you just shove 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 wool into a tiny space the soap can't get through it well so um anyway 
To answer your question, yes. I do think it makes it significantly easier. I just open my fleece up, put it in, basically push a button. Um, so yes. I always say if I sell my mill equipment, the washer is probably something I would keep because I don't know if I can go back the other way. Um, Southern Bear asked about Wish, and she is sleeping next to me, although she did just wag her tail. Um, Wish, they wondered if Wish lives at the mill or if Wish travels back and forth with me. Wish actually lives at the mill. Uh, Wish's story basically is that she came to us from somebody I know. Oh my gosh, that was the loudest truck ever. They're doing construction on the road through town here, so it's a little extra loud. Um, Wish came to us, she was going to be a barn cat for us. So she was an outdoor only barn cat before we got her. Um, and so she came to us because we needed more barn cats because of mice and all the things. They do, a, they do an important job on the farm. So she came to us, um, she was incredibly friendly. We kind of had her in the transition period of keeping her inside or um, we had her in my studio and she was so friendly so friendly that I was concerned that our dogs would hurt her because our dogs need cats that will be smart and stay away from them. Um, our farm dogs, that is, our more outside dogs. So I was very concerned that she would not be safe with our dogs because she was so overly friendly. Uh, she may actually, I mean, she's definitely smart enough She's definitely smart enough that she can out with the dogs pretty well, but it was very obvious that she was happy inside. <laughs> um, and when I messaged with the person we got her from, she said the place that she came from, all Wish wanted to do was go inside and they just, it was not part of the plan. So Wish, uh, I ended up bringing Wish here to the mill and um, because our cats, just a lot of reasons our indoor cats i didn't think needed another cat at that point so she lives here at the mill she loves her space i've thought about bringing another cat in for her but you know i think she is probably pretty happy okay i finally had to give up and close one of the doors um so anyway wish lives here in the mill and she's so happy she gets to go outside when i'm here i will open a door for her and it's hit and miss if she goes out. Sometimes she'll go out. She loves to go just kind of find a shady spot and sleep more. <laughs> um, or she goes underneath the building sometimes and wanders under there, but she generally doesn't stay out very long. And she just, she's living the dream. She's got like 2000 square feet that are her place. And mill days are her favorite days. Um, when people come in, she is always up in everybody's business staring at their wheels, batting at their yarn if she feels like she's not getting enough attention or just, you know, as soon as somebody gets up, she's in their spot. So um, she's living her best life, that is for sure. Um, but she doesn't go back and forth. She just has this domain for herself. Um, and she seems happy that way. Jessica asked, when blending the Angora, in the last episode, I blended a Angora rabbit with wool. Do the staple lengths need to be the same? So this is always, a great question. Um, on my equipment, because it is a little bit different, right? On my equipment, there is a lot of room for fibers to fall out, right? So it is more important when I'm using my equipment here at the mill to try to keep staple lengths similar because this, in theory, the shorter fibers are going to fall out more than the longer, heavier fibers. That said, um, on that batch, I definitely was aware the Columbia wool that I blended the Angora with was not super long. The Angora was a longer Angora, so it kind of worked out that they were similar staple lengths. Also, similar staple lengths make it easier to hand spin. Well, they definitely make it easier to spin on commercial spinning equipment. They'll make for a more even yarn. When you're hand spinning, it just is easier if the staple lengths are similar length because of where your hands are. That said, they don't always have to be similar length. And you know, I usually try within an inch or so, you know, ideally, it doesn't always work out. Uh, when you're using like a blending board or even, even a carding machine or hand cards, you're not gonna get as much loss. Uh, so I don't think it's quite as important to have the staple lengths as similar. And you're hand spinning, so you can manipulate the fibers a little bit better. It may be slightly more challenging to keep a consistent yarn, but, um, but you can do whatever. I mean, right? That's the joy of 
making your own yarn. So uh, and ideally here at the mill, I try to keep staple length similar. You have more play with it, I think, if you're doing stuff at home. Um, Arwen asked about the Christmas trees upstairs. Uh, when I was doing the tour, there's Christmas trees, very visible. Um, so I'm gonna go with, they basically live there all the time, but I will say, and that's just cause I'm lazy and I never move them back from that space, but Christmas season, I do plug the lights in. So there you go. Um, D heard, that's just their, their, uh, name on YouTube asked how far the mill is from my home. I drive about 20 minutes. Uh, when we first opened the mill, I lived about seven minutes away, which was probably the ideal, uh, but 20 minutes is not too bad. Um, that person mentioned that, you know, have, travel when owning a business does make a big difference as far as how much you get done, which is totally true. Um, sometimes I wish that I were closer. Sometimes I wish the mill was at my home and then I remind myself, no. No, thank you. Um, I know lots of you know that I used to own a dog hotel up in Portland and I lived on site of the dog hotel for many, many years. Not good for me. <laughs> Not good for me and for the way I work uh, because I never stopped. So I'm very grateful that the mill is a distance from home. And it's the same with Mitch with um, the farm. We used to live on site at the farm, like where all the equipment and the shop was. And it's kind of nice for him to have separation. There are plenty of times where he says the same thing, like, oh, it would be so much easier if I could just walk out the door or walk in the door to have lunch. But, um, I think it's easier. And this is what I've learned from having other businesses. It's just easier to be able to walk away. It's never gone from your brain, your business, but not physically being able to do something in it does make it a little easier to rest. <laughs> so, um, Maisie, this I think is the last question. Maisie asked if I have milled targi. And I actually haven't milled targi and I'm gonna write it on my list of like wools to look for. It's not something that we grow, that I see around here, but that doesn't mean I wouldn't love to mill it. So um, if anybody has great targi shepherds that they know of, feel free to comment below or send me a message, but I haven't milled it but I will put it on my list to kind of keep an eye out for, cause it would be fun. I always enjoy milling stuff I haven't milled before. So, whew. okay, that was all the questions for this time. Feel free to ask more questions, giveaway. Um, there will be a giveaway, comment below by next Tuesday, of course. If you're listening to the audio podcast, you can always jump into YouTube and put a comment in there. That works. Or you could send me an email. That works too. Whatever works for you. But I don't want you to feel like you're excluded because you're not watching on YouTube. So um, go ahead and do that. I'm gonna make sure I didn't just unplug that. So here's my question. It's sort of random. And as I said, comment anything you want. But if I give you a topic, maybe it helps sometimes. Um, how do you settle? And that's sort of a weird question, but like settle down when you're just like, I'm going to relax now. Do you go to your making or do you find other ways to settle? Do you read? Do you watch TV? Does your making, is your making not considered settling for you? So such an interesting thing. I was, um, somebody asked me that recently, like they didn't understand that knitting was settling for me. Like that's how I settle at the end of the day. I sit down and I spin or I knit. It's very rare that I just sit and like watch TV at the end of the day. Um, so I'm just curious where you all lay. And I have dreams of sitting and reading, but then you know what I end up knitting or spinning. So anyway, I'm just curious what settling means to you all. And um, I think we're gonna pop over to, so anyway, I almost forgot to follow that up with, enter the giveaway, comment below, end of day next Tuesday. Let me know also, well, you know, make sure to check back to see if you're a winner. Um, a couple just quick things. I, my online spinning course for learning to hand spin as a beginner is there's a Zoom session starting in a, I think two or three weeks. So if you have been thinking about purchasing the online course, and you want to be a part of the Zoom sessions, this is a great time to go on and grab the course up. You have access to it right away. You can start from home at your own pace, but it gives you some time to kind of jump in. So if you have specific questions once the Zoom start, they're there. They are so much fun. I just can't tell you. I have so much fun in the Zoom. So um, 
Last thing is my Patreon. I was gonna show, see those little packages right there. Those are some of the special thing going out to my uh, some of my patrons over on Patreon. We have a Zoom there. It is also lots of fun. There is a fun group of people from around. We have somebody, um, Linda, who's out in Ireland. We have Jessica, who is in, Jessica, I think you had a question. Oh yeah, Jessica, yours was there. I answered your question. Um, Jessica is in Canada. We have people in California. It's just really fun to have such a mix and such a different level of people in their fiber or yarn journey in Patreon. We have a lot of fun in the Zoom. So go over, check that out. There's a link in the profile if you're interested. And um, okay, I think that's all the like house cleaning stuff I needed to do. So. I'm gonna pop in a couple of videos here over at the grass seed farm. I'm gonna to try to hit the hazelnuts on my way home. And then a couple of videos from our trip to the Columbia River Gorge. I'll see you in a minute. All right, I came out to run this guy and to get this girl, cause she was working. She's up in the front seat. And to say hi to that guy. I thought I'd show you. So here is an annual grass field. And you can see it's very tall. I'll step back so you can kind of see it in relation to the car. So it's nice and tall and it is pollinating time currently. It is no joke. And then if I, you can kind of see to the left, this is um, bank grass. It's much, much shorter. It gets harvested. It's the last grass that we harvest. And this is um, golf course grass. So this is uh, on the tee and greens. Wade and Mitch, sorry, of golf courses. I'm going tee to green just because that's the name I know. Um, so different grasses for different things. And there's Cash and he's like, can we please? He literally, we went all the way down and then he eventually just walked himself back and waited at the car. And Elsie Mae's been down here with dad for a couple hours, so she is ready to go home. We're gonna go cool off. All right, all, we're out at the hazelnuts. I was about to show you the Dane. There he is. Oh, there's another one behind me. There's the boys. Helping make sure I'm not up to trouble. Wade's out here. What timing that I could be out here with Wade. He's mowing, I believe, in between the trees. Let's say hi. All right, so here we are out at the hazelnut trees. So you can see they actually have, there's a tractor starting behind me. They have a good amount of leaves on them. Uh, and they look beautiful. You can see that the bottom of them do not have any offshoots, and that is the goal. So, um, basically you go around, not me, but you, them, and they go around and trim up uh, the bottom little shoots here. So, for the same reason that you trim everything else, right? So that it doesn't take nutrients away from the main tree that is growing. So they'll come through and this is, hazelnuts get to be quite a lot of work because that needs to be done. And then as they get bigger, they will uh, continue needing to be trimmed up and pruned. And there's the hills and more trees, trees and trees. And Wade is getting ready to farm between the trees. So he's working on some stuff and I was gonna show you, oh, here we go one tree that he pointed out and it's happened a couple times we did lose a couple trees it sounds like a handful he said five percent was kind of your normal um so this one was for all intensive purposes dead as you can see but then you look down here and this beautiful little shoot has popped up so you can see there so the goal is just to um let that one be a happy happy little tree and you can see down here, like here's one that didn't make it. And I believe that they'll go in and just pop new trees in. There's a sad one, didn't make it. But all in all, they're very pretty. All right, finally, I made it out to the hazelnuts for you all. And this is 
They are officially, they're just over a year old. So they were planted, I think in February of last year. So all these babies are um, just over a year old and doing well. Okay, see you in a bit. back we've covered the videos we've covered the questions we've covered my works in progress i will have more mill videos for you next time a lot of them i can't show right now because i've got fiber club coming up which there are spots available in my monthly fiber club um, it's a lot of fun there is a zoom for the monthly fiber club as well so there's so many ways to zoom with so many awesome people and i have so much fun in all of them i hope all of you that are in the zooms have fun every single time i'm writing notes and learning um, from you all so it's just really fun i think that's it you all i am going to go cart up some wool and hit the road and try to go see some hazelnuts on my way on the road i hope you all are doing well wherever you are i hope you're enjoying the season you are in of life and, and outside um, and I will see you soon, everybody. And don't forget to subscribe. If you like what I'm doing, subscribe to the audio podcast, subscribe on YouTube. That's how all these things know that you like what I'm doing. So I appreciate you all. Take care, stay healthy, have fun, be kind, and make lots of pretty things until I see you next time.